Hello! Hello! I'm John Proxim from Tunnel Tunnel Blessed, and uh, I, I don't know why I felt the need to say that three times. I'm having a torment, tides of Numenera adventure. I'm just changing my glasses uh, to make them less reflective. Uh, I, I'm, I'm investigating a murder! Um, yes, I am. Puzzle me, Eridus. Are you handsome or just ridiculously confident? Just those two? I'll put you down for both. So, uh, I believe I interviewed the Devourer of Wrongs already, but I'll go back and double check. So, um... Which the Dendro herd do you think is responsible for the murders in the underbelly? Um, all of them could be. Run farewell. So, though, this is Gazai, or however the hell you pronounce that. So, welcome back, Tendling, she croons, as if singing to a tasty child. Uh, I have more questions about the murders in the underbelly. That word again, but ask. Okay, okay, I interviewed her already. Farewell. Uh, yes. No. So, uh, Kia Tower. She doesn't spare words on you this time. She merely nods, her wary gaze cataloging every position in everyone of everyone in the room. Her eyebrows arch curiously, and it's that simple movement that makes a strange connection in your mind. You've seen that expression before on a somewhat similar face. Ah! The ghostly woman in the fifth eye. I'll remember that. Okay, we've finished the uh, action imitation. What's bothering you? Nothing. No offense, but I don't know you at all. Leave me alone, all right? All right. And B two says I can ask you about the murders in the underbelly. Yeah, she says, looking over the old man. He nods. Good. I have to say, I'm not surprised the murderer's trail led you here. What do you want to know? Uh, do you have any idea who the murderer is? No, she says, resting her hands on her hips. But I've seen what they've left behind. Oh, Fulsom's boy. A mess. Blood on the walls and floor. No body. She flicks a strand of hair out of her eyes. That's the kind of death you see when someone's sending a warning. Or holding a grudge. I saw it all the time before I came here. The circle's not a warning, it's a sign. She, her thoughts say. Um... And my voice is working good. Um, why do you think someone killed Fulsom's protege? Why? She says with something approaching a grin. Why? This is someone Fulsom cared about. He had lots of enemies. Why do you think? Uh, do you know anything about the Endless Gate? No, she says. Never heard of them. Are you sure you've never heard of the children of the Endless Gate before? She shakes her head, looking confused. I want to know your opinions on the other Dendro her. Ha! She says. All right. Don't expect me to hold back. What are your feelings on Imbitu? He's lived for too long, she says. Maybe the Dendro her something once, but he's just looking for his next meal now. The rest of them are following his example. How do you feel about Mallet? He likes hurting people. More than that, he's proud of it. She runs an angry hand through her hair and lowers her voice. I'm not sure, but I think he's been killing rivals from his old life and eating them. I know he's killed. He's probably eight too. Why wouldn't he? Uh, what do you think of Gazai? She used to be worse than she is. If you haven't talked to her yet, you'll see what I mean. She glances at the mutant uneasily. Maybe all those corpses she's eating on her own are bringing sages into her head. Civilizing her, maybe. She shakes her head. But that just means she's a predator who knows the mind of her prey. She's a monster, she thinks. Certainly she's murdered to eat. Why wouldn't she? She doesn't think of that as murder, though. Not if you leave the body behind. So I have some other questions. Uh, I'm done talking about the murderer. What's bothering you? Right, fair one. So it definitely isn't the devourer of wrongs, because he wasn't even there, but this is Mallet. Uh, 
B2 gave me permission to ask you about the murders. Oh, he actually said, sorry. What do you want, shoal meat? He says, leering. Uh, yeah, alright. Ask a question. For all the good it will do you. Have you ever heard of something called the Endless Gate? No, he says. Strange name, though. If it don't end, it ain't much of a gate, is it? It's, it's more of a hallway. Uh, do you know Weedle? Huh, <laughs> he says, yeah. I knew him. Glad to hear he's dead. He chuckles. He was smart and knew it. Always looking down on the rest of us. Always ordering people around with fulsome looking on. Smiling. He snorts. But if you're thinking I chopped him, I didn't. I was getting drunk in the corner of the manufactory. He grins nastily. Wondering what all the screaming was about. Damn uppity lack nibber. I should have been Folsom's man. Not him. Hmm. Making a note. Yeah. You know who you should ask, he says, leaning in. Kiwatawa. I saw her hunched over some corpse in an alleyway all by herself. Doesn't matter what the meat is. People who eat on their own always got something to hide. He nods to the other cultist. And Gazai's one to watch too. She ain't like you or me. She's a mutant. And not one of the nicer ones. And everyone eats on their own. Everyone's got something to hide. So he suspects everyone. Um, hmm. I'm going to have to look through the notes for this one. I'm guessing it's one of these three because that's more interesting it suddenly being someone else. Um, I want to talk to you about your eating habits. Is that right? He says, scratching one of his sharpened teeth. Not much of a mystery there. I eat people. I like it. He shrugs. If that doesn't answer your question, go on and ask. Uh, Kiritawa says you've been eating people instead of waiting for them to die. Updated my journal. People? She said that? She shoots a dark look at Kiritawa. Yeah, alright, but not people, he says, stretching his neck thick. It was just the one, someone, yeah. I ain't gonna give you a name who stole something from me once. And the fact you ain't here asking about him means nobody misses him. Right, I'm gonna have to believe that, aren't I? Because that's... And that's it. You never got the urge to kill again, or you sound like a man with a lot of grudges. Sure you didn't decide to settle some of Folsom? Actually, let's go for that one. You must think I'm an idiot, he says. Sometimes grudges pay off, right? Make you feel good. Right in your gut. Slaps his belly. But no one, no one, ever gets the better of Fulsom. Even if I killed every one of his protégés, and I'm not saying I killed even one, the man would have me skinned and hung before I dropped my club. Settle grudges? Sure. Settle grudges with Fulsom? No. Never. So he didn't do it. I have no bloody idea who did it then. Um, doesn't eating human flesh bother you? Bother? No, bother ain't the right word. Rubs the back of his neck. You think you're gonna mind the taste, but you don't. The part I don't like is the memories from the person you eat end up in your head, and you can't make them shut up. The four of us ate this skull arc. Not a fancy one, but one with old robes. Kia Tower was talking about some words she kept hearing after. He scowls. I didn't get a word. I saw a memory of his when I was picking him out of my teeth. He was lying in bed. Dying, maybe. Waiting for his son to come see him. His eyes kept closing. Closing, and his son never came. He shakes his head like a beast, trying to dislodge a biting insect. Not that I saw her anyway. And that's just from one meal. They get in my head, make me forget who's me. And B2 says it gets easier, but... Perception. His eyes flicker away from you, and for a brief second, moment even, you see the fear in his eyes, the helplessness. Why do you eat corpses if it troubles you so much? It doesn't trouble me, he growls, but his voice is shaking. It just ain't easy. But it'll get better. Look at him, B2. He's been doing this a long time. 
So he's a bit of a thug. And he is a murderer. He's murdered at least one person. But I don't think he didn't do that. You glance at Mbitu, the elderly head of the Dendro O'Hare waves and gives you a huge rotten grin. Okay, let's talk about something else. Um, tell me about the other members of your family. Family, he repeats. <laughs> Good one. I trust my brother over this bunch, and he tried to cut my throat when I was five. He clucks his tongue. Go on, ask your questions. What's your opinions on Mbitu? He's all right, Mallard says. Got half the city scared of him, and the other half bringing him meat. Not bad for an old man who smiles at everyone and never raises his voice. I hope to be half that feared when I'm done. More than half. Hmm. Ah, uh, what do you think of Gazai? Gazai is a monster, he says, shaking his head. Less human and more than a beast. I've seen her take a corpse face off with a swipe of those claws and tuck it in her mouth like pan bread. Didn't stop until the body was gone. Down to the last drop. He bites his upper, li upper lip, drawing ribbons of blood. Talk to the Gazai if you want. Figure her out. Me. I'll keep my distance. It's not Gazai either, because she eats all her food. She wouldn't leave a hand behind. How do you feel about Kiwatawa? He opens his mouth to respond. Closes it, thinking. Something's wrong with her, he says finally. And I ain't stupid. I know how that sounds. Coming from me, just something broken in her and it's always getting worse she's my prime suspect finish talking about the murder let's remind ourselves What's bothering you? Oh yeah, Kiwatara's the uh, the ghost lady, so I didn't actually get much. The mallet says he caught you eating a corpse on your own. Yeah, maybe mallet should mind his business, she says, shooting an angry look at the hulking cultist. Sure, it's true. I don't like being down there more than I have to, alright? I barely even sleep anymore. Keep getting the feeling that they're waiting for me to die. Wondering what I'd taste like. Making a note. Not too long ago, I found a corpse in the alley near Circus Minor, and I didn't see why I should share it with this lot. She drags her finger through her hair. That's it. No secret. No scandal. And since Mallet thinks he can share my hunting with strangers, maybe you should ask him how many corpses he's found on his own. Or if they were even actually dead when he found them. Mallet's killed and eaten, I'm sure of it. They probably all do. Are you sure you've never heard of the children in the endless gate? Okay, she's confused. I don't know who it is then. Um, alright, Gazai again. By the bloody circles, junks yard outside of the bloom. Last year, a yard last year outside the bloom. All right, farewell. Let's do it. Right, let's go to the um, omniscope. Check out outside the bloom. I'm going. Let's save our game before I forget as well. Also, we have a ghost to visit. Um, and if I trance myself, then it's probably uh, a job done right. smarter than murdering, you know, suiciding. Yes. I'm hoping this is a quick way to the teleporter. One of them will be the. Yeah, this will do it. Turn my phone off. 
Pour some tea into some tea. Faffed around a bit too long before I started the episode. Use the machine. Could you tone down the glow, lad? I have a bit of a hangover. Glow? What glow? I thought the entire world was golden. Uh, let's use the teleportation console and go to the uh, caravanserai. There we go. Lovely. I hope. I think this is correct. I hope and think. Right, um... I, okay, it's right. Let's list. Look at the bloom. Alright, uh, we're looking, we were order, already had it set to the correct place. Um, the bloom sees a lot of diverse traffic. Okay. Damn. I need to know that conversation. Uh, Circus Miner? Yes, I've questioned Kiritaro. She claims she doesn't know who the killer is, but she's seen this kind of murder before. It's just the killer was sending a warning or holding a grudge. Malik claims he was getting drunk in the corner of the manufactory. Let's check that out when Weedle was killed. Harvey did admit he knew Weedle, and it sounds like the pair didn't know each other much. Uh, Malik warned me not to trust Kiritaro and Gazai. He apparently saw Kiritaro eating corpse in the alley. By herself, suggested to him that she had something to hide. Describes Gazai as particularly nasty sort of mutant. No. Mallet also admitted to killing a man. Uh, Kiritaro admitted to finding a corpse in the city, but she didn't want to share it with the other Dendra, so she ate it alone. I should have probably talked to um, Mallet again, actually. Uh, circus Miner. Right, Circus Miner. Speak to the merchants there. Right. Go. I'm currently in Circus Miner. On my way. See, if I wait another day, someone else will die as well, so I don't want to do that, but I know I'm running out of skills to use. This feels kind of important. I also need to go downstairs and go to the manufactory and talk to someone. These merchants. Right, now you. The thief returned, the merchant said. Falinda wondered why, but did not ask. Right, right I know a merchant. Merchant has not supplied me anything yet.
Hmm, hang on. Oh. Ah, no, Prata, there we go. Generic. Right, um, have you seen a Dendro Her woman in the market lately? Hmm, she says her mandibles click. No, near the market? Yes, I was closing up shop and only noticed her because she was staggering a little and talking to herself. Do you remember what the Dendro Her woman you saw was saying? I'll remember that. Something about circles, Prater says. Hmm, that's it. She kept talking about a hollow circle. A red hollow circle. She giggles. I didn't know the Dendro Her got drunk. Um. Okay. Here comes the boredom slayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go downstairs. So. Let's uh, make sure I know. Akira Tower. Yeah. Yes. Right, let's go underground. Yes, lad. Uh, let's talk to about you again. What's your story, Tibia? Oh, the usual. Farm boy joins one war or another. He doesn't die. He gets a sound spanking by the world till he learns to spank it back. I want to hear more about your background. And I don't blame you, he declares, clapping you on the shoulder. But I warn you, I've never had a handle on what people consider too much information. A smile crinkles the corners of his eyes. Never looked for one either. Go on, ask your questions. I've got answers for everyone. Tell me about your life as a soldier. I didn't mean to do this, but I may as well. Uh, well, I wasn't the best, or the worst, he says with a shrug, but I started on at the bottom, fell out the side, and ended up a gallant glass on my own, he sighs. It's not an easy, easy life, being a mercenary, but you try and find the causes you believe in and avoid striking blows that aren't deserved. And you try not to fail at both while the realities of life batter you into new shapes, change you. Some of the best days of my life, though, despite the tears. You said the realities of life changed you. How? Not one for the light questions, are you? He rubs his hands together. My father raised me to be honest. Well, honesty works on a farm. Animals don't lie to you much. As a rule. Uh, but as a soldier, he squints. I put it like this. First night in the camp, I was mugged by my sergeant and left for dead. All because I thought an honest face meant an honest heart. It's the honest ones you have to watch out for. So, I've adapted my approach over the years. I reward kindness with kindness, cruelty with justice, and foolishness with object lessons on the way the world works. He winks. But there's something sombre there. Uh, everyone has their lessons to learn. In this side. I'll get a ticket. Everyone has a lesson to, lessons to learn in this life. Best that your teachers are kind men, I always say. Uh... Who have you fought for? Whew, he says with a misty look in the air. I fought for a number of causes over the years. My first fight was alongside the rugged cattle men of the plowshares, trying to keep the slave families of Sage's Protectorate from getting their hands on the bared folks' grazing lands. He shrugs. But I've been over all over the map, and off the edges too, having a good times and bad. Went with the Alu Rebels, the White Company, even fought in the endless battle for a while. Until I figured out my commander was lying to me. Walked away from a hefty purse on that one, I tell you. But it was the right thing to do. And the safest. And the sanest. I should have left earlier. Pay or no pay. <coughs> can you tell me about the endless battle? Of course I can, he says. But for a moment, it seems he won't. His mouth works, but no words come out. It was more of a nightmare than a war, he says at last. We marched out one morning to take a certain hill and we took it. He winces. Then a shivery little ripple crossed the battlefield. We were back on the march, heading for the same hill. Only this time, the other side routed us. I lost this arm. He shows it to you, smooth and unmarked. You think our commander would have given us the rest of the war off, but no. His eyes go hard and grim. 
She kept making us fight until the waves of time died down and we took that damn hill and held it. He smiles wearily. I'm... I'm certain I died a few times myself. But here I am, still whole and handsome as ever. What's the point of the endless battle? Fighting itself... The fighting itself is pointless. All those lads and lasses dying for a cause centuries old. He smirks sadly, his gaze distant. Now, I know I just described any war, but we both know that certain people make a tiny profit from bloodshed on a grand scale. And the endless battle... Well, it's endless. And that makes it endlessly profitable. I have other questions about you, if you don't mind. Um, tell me more about your background. Uh, all right. I want to hear a story from your past. I want to hear about some of your mercenary work. Too many stories in the stat sack to tell you a single sitting, he says, scratching his head. But I'll stick to one with the least amount of back alley murders. It's too lovely a day for grim tales of bloodshed. He squints at the air. It was just after I'd left the military life. I was desperate to make a name for myself as a mercenary. Too desperate, as it turns out. He clears his throat. <coughs> I was drinking in my favourite bar. Felt a soft touch on my shoulder. It was a lady. Navarine nobility, she said, and in need of a bodyguard. Groaning, he covers his eyes. And that body, those eyes. I accepted on the spot, of course. She tried telling me why she needed me, something about assassins at a ball. But I was too busy watching her hips shift between that dress, beneath that dress. Uh, I followed her around that ball with barely a thought in my head. And halfway through the party, she executes herself and comes back in different clothes. He chuckles, though there's no humour in it. She tells me that to anyone who asks, I'm her husband, Baron Giyak of Navarine and that we have to leave immediately. We worked our way towards the door, but were stopped by the host of the ball and the phalanx of the city guards. They demanded to know who I was, grimaces. Terrified, but right on cue, I say, I'm Baron Nikask of Gavaline, and this is my knife. Shakes his head. Thirty days in the blocks as, a, as an accessory. Turns out she's stolen a fortune in living gems from her upstairs bedroom. She wasn't any kind of noble, just a common, beautiful thief. And the next time I saw her, she was dead. Life isn't fair for anyone, and that's the truth. How about one of those good times you mentioned? Oh, I've had plenty, he says, running his teeth over his lip. Running his teeth over his lip? Uh, more good than bad, even as a gallow glass. But of course there is one that sounds out. He isn't smiling now, despite his words. My partner at the time, my old sergeant, and I heard of a scrap gr brewing on the border between two mercenary armies over territory. He scratches his moustache. We got there, and knew it was going to be a bloodbath the, mo the moment someone went for a weapon. They'd been rivals for too long, see? It's a sad, sad thing to see professional killers turn violent. Now, I was thinking we should get back on the road, and as far from the fight as possible, but my partner, he was a tinkerer. A soft gleam rises in his eyes. He had these two rings he was messing with at the time. Claimed they could link minds. He wanted to plant one on each side, you know. Get them seeing things from the other's point of view. I couldn't talk him out of it. He snuck around in the dark of night, cursing and thumping. Set up the damned things in rival camps and ran back to our distant hill to watch. He rubs his eyes. All night long we heard strange things. Sort of wet sounds, you know? Laughter. Happy, happy sighing. He runs his hands through his hair. Then dawn came. There was a different kind of war going on in the mud below. He flashes a grin. The kind where everyone wins. Turns out that once they got a taste for each other's thoughts, they found out they hadn't wanted to fight each other after all. Not exactly. That was Ovi of you. That was Ovi for you, he finishes with a touch of a smile, always bringing out the truth in people. Oh, that's sort of a sweet story. In a... In a sort of way. A better man than I deserved, certainly. Who's Ovi? 
Ooh, got some experience. Huh? He says eyebrows climbing. Oh, let his name slip, did I? Aubergine was the old sergeant I mentioned. First we were partners. Then, more than that, by a long shot. He sinks his thumb beneath his belt. But, well, you know things. They change. Grinning, Tibir shakes his head. <laughs> I haven't thought about that man in years. And that's why I hadn't thought about him. Too hard. Perception. You can't help noticing that his hands hooked to his belt are trembling. Oh, that's something else. Ah, right, let's talk another time. I got something I have in there. Learned about Aubergine, his sergeant. Uh, I was going underground. That was Tibia, wasn't it? Does it say if I learn anything about him? No, it doesn't. Um, and yes, I need to remember to... Eritus, Eritus, Eritus. Yes, Eritus? I was just thinking how wonderful it would be if there were three. Okay. Have you seen any Dendro Oha in the manufactory lately? Making a note. What does this have to do with anything? The construct roars. I am supposed to take stock of every. Am I supposed to take stock of every human that stumbles aimlessly across my floor? It pauses, its two bright eyes scanning the ceiling. Ah, yes. I did see one, as a matter of fact. A large male was lounging under one of the pipes, drinking and slobbering on himself then. It continues in the tone of deep disgust. He slept right through all that shrieking about a murder. Barely even woke up to vomit on himself. There we go. Here comes the boredom, Slayer. Let's talk to Folsom. I know who the murderer is. I think it's Kira Tower. I'm gonna go with it. Just go with it. The young woman, Kia Tower. Making a note. Forty XP. Interesting, he says. A quiet woman, somewhat fragile. I sensed an instability in her, but not the aptitude for violence. I will be interested to learn what my people can extract from her. He signals to his bodyguards. They slip from his side and flit towards the Dendro Her Chapel at a flat run. Some time later, the bodyguards race back to Folsom's side. One of them whispers in his ear and he nods. Kiyotao was already gone, he says. She must have suspected you were close to proving her guilt. At least she has fled. I doubt she'll return. As growls deep in his throat. If you ever see her again, feel free to do the same thing to her that she did to my people. He gestures to one of his bodyguards. She hastened forward for you, with your reward. Folsom looks away. Farewell, godling. Yes, lad. I'll find Kirita, I promise you. Alright, I'm supposed to see you again, he says, though his face displays no such thing. You've named our murderer, and justice is done. Do we have any other business to discuss? And that's why I said I found Kirita. Good, he says, his broad shoulders sagged. But the dead will remain dead. Alright, very well. Done. Um. Right, farewell. So, okay. 
Is that the mission done? Um, yeah, it does. It's gone. So we have a. We can afford to sleep, I think. All right. So. Let's go to an inn and do the rest of Ashen Imitation, which I named an episode after, but I assume we're going to call this one the Red Circle. Um, I have to look it up. Of course. Of course. Hmm. Oh, no, I did get a level up. Alright. What's effort again? Yes. Alright, he's got extra effort now. At last. Um Like, Kira Tower is the Ashen Imitation anyway, though, so... Um, so that sort of builds into it. In fact, I should check the mission log. Again, I'm reversed, that's why. Uh, let's see, I even knows. I have secrets to exchange. I want to trade information for another secret you find interesting. Secret about Sage's Cliffs. Alright, Mallet, one of the Dendra, killed and ate someone who stole from him. Hmm, she says, touching the air beside her neck. From what I understand of the Dendra owe her, that's hardly murder from their point of view. It is merely... She pauses. Impolite. Still, that's useful information. Now, for your interesting secret. She traces the corner of her lips thoughtfully. The merchants, uh, Felinda and Storisti, are in love. They have been for many, many years. Felinda has never heard Storisti's voice. Oh. Let's see if we can help them out. Oh well. They don't like me very much though. Ooh, circles in red. Yes. Circles in red. Sorry, just naming the episode. So, Kira Tower. Yes, there we go. Loss of Self, Sinjin, and Kira Tower. So, At last. we are going to the inn. I'm getting stuff done. Now, I do have to figure out some stuff about his crash ship, but I figure doing a couple of quests is probably a good idea. I'm trying not to be as thorough as it was before, but... uh. Right, um, it's like room for the night. Ah, 20 shins. Give her the money. 80 shins. 20 shins per person. Never get enough of that. There we go. Game saved. Um, put me in the trance again. Slightly less nerve wracking than murdering myself every time I want to visit with my brain space. My tea's cold. All right. 
Right, so I sort of started this before, but I actually deleted that save. It's the only time I've done that, but... All right. Now let's do this properly. Find out about the Ashen Imitation. Ghostly woman. Look! You follow her finger to the glowing form where before there was nothing. It's a member. You found one of them already. The woman created by the engine. On it. It's loss of self. Her. Uh, the siege, he says, watching the scene in front of you. I remember the siege when the Tabat came to destroy the Sage's Cliffs. Were you there? After a long, quiet moment. I'm turning the sound down. After a long, quiet moment, she nods as though coming to a decision. I was there. I remember the screams. The terror. The Tabat came, many of them mounted on their dragger lifts, each of them with a stranger uh, more sorry, each of them with a stranger more terrifying weapon than the one before. Sages should have fallen, like Shusha and Ika and the hundred villages before us. But it didn't. We fought them off. It's coming back to me. These are my memories, she thinks. She shakes her head. But what does it have to do with the other women? I don't know. There's more to this story and I need your help to find it. Well, if it works for Cloud, it'll work for this lady as well. Um, one of them offers joy and sorrow for coin. Her family is not her own and it's borrowed, I think. One of them is dead, yet a piece of her lives. Find that piece. One of them. Alright, so I think there's more. I'm still missing a couple then. There's a Sinjin. So, uh, her what? The ghostly woman. Uh, her eyes grow wide at the scene in front of you. That's me! I remember now, the siege ended. The Tabat were driven back, and I was among the survivors, but... She places a hand on the surface of the chamber. I didn't exactly survive. One of the Tabat's weapons... I have no idea if I'm pronouncing Tabat right. Tab... Tabat. Uh, weapons made me sick somehow in my mind. My father was an explorer and a tinkerer. He knew something about the Numenera. He put me there to protect me. But the Aeon priests and the Shigurans couldn't help me. Um, Shigeon or whatever. No one could. My father kept me in stasis until a cure could be found. She gazes into the distance, as if they're trying to remember something. Are the women the result of some attempted cure? I don't know. Please. We're so close. Keep looking so we can find the answer. I wonder if she's the woman that ran away. I'm ready. Let's go tower. A translucent man appears. He is unfamiliar to you. He appears to be working on the machine. The ghostly woman watches him, her brow furrowed. I know him. The engine, it's... Who is he? It's going to be me, isn't it? Oh, no. I think he's my father. She tilts her head. The memories of this place must be fuzzy. He doesn't look right. It's going to be me, isn't it? Uh, or a version of me. Uh, but he feels right. I'm certain it's him. She reaches out for the translucent figure, but her hand goes right through him. She calls out, Father! Father! 
The man continues his work as if she wasn't there. The ghostly woman sags. I'm invisible to him. You! She places a solid hand on your shoulder. Her eyes suddenly lit. He used that machine, that probably probability engine, to recreate me in other women. The machine is but a memory, but the engine exists in the real world. I know it, Gabina. She looks at the ghostly man. Speak to him. Find out how to turn it off. Then you can do the same in the real world and end this. I'll remember that. Uh, the ghostly woman's father um, works frantically, turning dials, stripping metal wires, attaching and detaching various pieces within the machine. After each change, he places a hand on the side of the machine, speaks some words and gestures in the air. He doesn't seem to notice you at all. Can I help? No, he says, but he doesn't appear to be speaking to you. That's not right. Her hair was softer, thinner, her eyes more like caramel. He speaks to the machine again, swipes through the air rapidly, and sticks his hand inside the engine and rearranges several delicate parts. I need to now turn the machine off. What? He whirls around, his eyes bright with fury. Turn it off? I would kill her. Kill her, you understand. I'm so close to bringing her back. It's just a matter of tuning the machine correctly. He dar his face darkens. I won't shut it down. and You won't force me. You, you will not force me, he says. Although he makes no signal or gesture, the Tabat soldiers from the other side of the, of the fathom run to his aid. Somehow this ghostly construct's anger has summoned them. Right, something's wrong with the machine. It's hurting people. So I leave! The platform rumbles with power and the pain of his cry. Leave me alone! You will not take what's left of my daughter from me! He waves you off. Ah! You're guessing! You don't know the side effects any more than I do. But I do know that this will bring her back to me. Now leave, or I force you to leave. Alright. Well, no, it's not the machine, it's a memory. I won't force you. Farewell. You can't force me. Yes. Let's go up here. I'm ready. Let's talk to the Tabat memories. I'm going. Uh, there's nothing here. Ready. All right, fam. Um, learn how to shut down the probability engine from the ghostly man. Um. There might be more ghostly women. I think she's still alive. I think it's the woman that ran away, maybe. So I'm not going to kill the ghostly man. Let's go. I'm going to find that guy. Yes. Now. And that might be why it's the innkeeper that does it. So let's go back. Yes. Maybe the machine worked. But I think it might be that runaway woman. Yeah, back up drip. Hmm. Yeah, well. Alright, is that dude still there? No, just these silver orphans. Tell the orphans about Sylph. 
You draw a crude approximation of Sylph next to the orphan's image, still visible in the dust. Who's Sylph again? It might be your imagination, but when you finish drawing, the orphans seem pleased. The orphan on the right reaches inside itself again, drawing out another object that drops you in your waiting hands. Another, yes. Well deserved is your reward. Who was Sylph? I'll let you know if I find any others. There's a stillness cage. I can sell it. I genuinely can't remember who Sylph is, but apparently I found another robot. So what am I doing now then? Okay, Ashen Imitation. Uh, beloved Slave. That's the book. Um, that's the adversary. Right. Settle the debt between Eretus and Master Renio. Um... The city will only pay for Renio's damages if they have the backing of someone influential. If such a person owes me a favour, I should return to the council clerk and tell him. So I need to do a favour for someone expensive, someone powerful. Like the Memovara. Let's do it. Now. Ooh, who's... So, uh, this is Cujano del Tobosco, scrawny old man, practically rattles inside a dull and dented armour that was clearly made for someone bigger than him. Nonetheless, his eyes burn with a bottomless fire, and his smile, as fierce as it is genuine, flashes beneath his graying thicket of a beard. Another night, he bellows! <laughs> Clapping your shoulders with his gauntleted hands. You barely keep your feet. The man is stronger than he looks. Another hero in search of great adventure. Yes, I am. You must stand before the wandering knight. It's, um... I. What's funny is, I guessed it from his name. Uh, it's, um... What, oh, what's it? What is it? Um... Sorry, I'm, I'm going to need to get the name in my head. Um... It's Don Quixote, isn't it? That's what they're doing here. So, um... You stand before the wandering knight, Kijano del Toboso. What brings you to the summit of Mount Ithador? He, he is armed like a knight, though he carries himself strangely. Eretus, we seek challenges that will test our very limits, Eretus declares, and then we shall shun those challenges as unworthy of us and seek quests that shake the foundations of the possible that defy belief, for we are not just adventurers, noble stranger, we are the breath of adventure herself. <laughs> his voice, his uh, thoughts goes, another hero, he is too strong and too strange. Tears well in Kihano's um, yeah, uh, it should have been really obvious it was Kahoti. Uh, Kihano's uh, eyes, and he fishes a monogram monogrammed handkerchief from the depths of one of his braces. Such noble company, he says hoarsely, dabbing his cheeks. Such a noble goal. Were I not committed to my own path, I would seek to join yours. He sighs heavily. But I will not. Instead, might I ask your blessing? Eretus, would you bless Kihano, as he asked. I was hoping you would ask, he says, and turns to Kihano, spreading his arms, his mouth working soundlessly. The elderly knight bounds his head. May your glory always find you. May your burdens only strengthen you, and each of your scars tell a better story than the last. And when your enemies are too many, and your wounds too severe, may you fall with a smile on your face, and peace in your faltering heart. Scan thoughts. That is lovely! Who wrote that? We did. Oh, I s the voices before. Um, the vo I wasn't... It wasn't the knight's voices. Uh, it was um, Eretus's insane brain voices. 
a perception. You clamp, uh, catch a barest glimpse of some of the golden aura surrounding Eretus flowing down his arms in glowing chains. Motes of light spin and wheel around the elderly knight before sinking into his armoured frame. Well said, Gihano says, raising moist eyes. Well said. He straightens and oddly seems larger somehow, taller even. Truly a knight. I feel his blessing coursing through my veins. Uh, Kihano del Tel Bosso uh, gains the inspired fettle. <laughs> but, uh, so, what? why did you call this Mount Ithador? It's a city, not a mountain. A city, he says, his sweat-beaded brow drawing together. Your senses must have deserted you in, this, in the ascent. The heat has baked you in your armor. He lays a gentle hand on your shoulder, turning you to the horizon. Do not allow delirium to blind you to your accomplishments, good knight. You've scaled the very heights of Mount Ithadar, the tooth of the world beast. Adventure lies in every shadow below us. Every sparkle of light is a quest ready for the taking. What brings you up here? Do you know, he says, I am not quite sure. My memory is not what it was. I recall kneeling before my family's armor in our state not some time ago. He blinks slowly. Perhaps I was weeping. He smashes his gauntlets against his chest, leaving a sizable dent. I can't recall, and it doesn't matter, for then I heard a thunderous roar and beheld a great beast in the skies. I donned my armor and gave chase. Uh, uh, what kind of beast was it? It defied description, he declares. And so I describe it to defy impossibility itself. Thirteen legs, six jaws, a thousand eyes are glitter with malice and flame. Scales the color of clouds. Uh, your armor looks slightly used. Yes, he says, nodding proudly. It has seen some use. My ancestor forged it in the fires of Silver Cloud Mountain for her battle against the Xeraquand hordes. That was the wound that killed her. He taps a much mended spot on the chest plate. In fact, many of my ancestors died in this armor. It served them well. All right. Go on. The horrible beast leered down at me, promising destruction. I promised it death, and it fled across the sky. I followed, darting between the trees. He paused, frowning. And I don't recall much after that. I remember walking, having various adventures along the way, of course. But I cannot quite recall why I came here. And that voice is going to kill me, so I'm going to take a sip. Ah. <clears throat> I know he should to have a Spanish accent, but I can't do Spanish, obviously. I can do old British soldier. It's like the only voice I can do. Right. But it's uh, and it's essentially uh, it's not Lord Melchard. It's like that. Um, what am I doing? It's a specific voice I'm recalling there. That sort of voice. Ah, he says, raising a finger. Of course, I must have had the frankly brilliant notion of scaling this lonely mountain to a better spot, the beast from a to better spot the beast from afar. He shakes his head, a wispy beard waggling. Alas, I've seen nothing so far. Doing, it's definitely someone's voice I'm trying attempting to do. I just can't figure out who it is. It'll be an actor. Um, your beast sounds like a particularly large cloud. I'm pretty sure you ran into a tree. Don't say that. That's a, that was an amazing story. Thank you. You are most welcome, he says, patting your hand fondly. It's so good to share my tales with a fellow knight. Everyone else raises such... Peculiar doubts. Uh, 
that's gonna bug me. I'm gonna figure out who I'm doing the voice of. <laughs> you said you were looking for a great adventure. Yes, but I feel I must speak plainly, he says, plucking at his beard. Too many people have mistaken me for a common mercenary. I am not interested in entangling myself in local quarrels. I will not hunt a beast that cannot hunt me in return. If I am to fight, it must be against a foe of such wickedness that the stars themselves wink out rather than that the stars themselves wink out rather than shine upon a world that could harbor such malevolent creature. Um The children of the Endless Gate slaughtered innocents in the underbelly. Will you hunt them down? I've heard of these scoundrels, he says. They leave pools of blood. <coughs> that was about to happen at some point. Sorry. They leave pools of blood and shredded flesh in their wake. You're right, my friend. This world cannot bear the blight of these villains upon her skin any longer. Simply say the word, and I shall hunt them in unto my dying breath. Yes. Good hunting, Kihano del Telbosso. Part of me thinks I should have sent him on a fake quest, and that he's going to die horribly. But I think dying horribly is probably what he want, if that makes any sense. I am going to have to figure out who I'm doing the voice of, but I'm going to let you go. I will say at the start of the next episode if I figure out who I'm... Yeah. Anyway, I've been John Fox on Channel John West. I've been having a torment, Tides of Numenera adventure. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for watching.